Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're having a fantastic day. I am back with another Unsolved Case Files case. So today's case is actually two victims. We have Avery and Zoe Gardner. I'm just gonna get right into this. I'm gonna read the back of this in a second. If this is your first time watching me do one of these cases, I typically go through all of the information first and show what's included. And then I will start trying to attempt to solve the case. I guess if you're just looking for the answer, then you can probably just skip to the end. If you want to play along, you can do that too with me. Let's just get into the background on the back of this. It says it's taking place in Davenport, Oregon. At 4.23 a.m. this morning, a man broke into the remote lake house where 19-year-old twins Avery and Zoe Gardner were asleep. An identified man murdered Avery and abducted Zoe before first responders could arrive. Police departments across two states are currently hunting for Avery's killer and her twin sister Zoe, but neither has been found. Homicide detective Angie Colon made a breakthrough in the case, but then mysteriously disappeared. She left her detective's notebook behind, but authorities aren't sure what to make of it. The killer is on the loose with two lives in his hands. Can you solve the case and get to Zoe and the detective before it's too late? Open this up now. Usually it's a folder that they have in here, and today is as you can see, the detective notebook. So I thought that's cool that they like kind of switched up what it normally looks like. As always, what's included, there's the three envelopes that you have to wait, you have to complete objectives before opening. So I always like to just put them to the side because we have to get through other stuff first. This is Davenport Police Investigation Notebook. Opening up, this says, please read first. Please help, this is Jack Paulson. I'm an officer at the Davenport Police Department and I desperately need your help. At 4.30 this morning, I responded to a 911 call from 19-year-old Avery, who was alone with her twin sister, Zoe. An attacker had broken into their house on Ashcroft Lake. By the time I got there, it was too late. The monster had already strangled Avery and left, taking Zoe with him. The entire Davenport, Davenport, I think it's Davenport, Nearly every police department across the state and I have been searching relentlessly for Zoe and the killer while our chief homicide detective Angie Colon led the investigation. Angie's not just the best detective I've ever met, she's also my fiance. We're getting married next spring. Several hours ago, she sent me a text that I said I figured out the accomplice and nothing else. She hasn't responded or answered her phone since. I stopped by her house and she left her notebook and phone on the counter, so I checked our driveway security camera and watched her sprint to her car and peel out moments after sending that text to me. It's unlike Angie to leave her notebook behind, but it's clear that she had cracked open the case and was in a rush. In that, we have the instructions, and the first objective is to identify the accomplice. And then when you identify the person who set up the twins, visit the webpage to prove it. So then you go online, and then you usually check a little box, and then it will tell you if you're right. And then that's when you open the envelope. So here's a picture of them. Pretty girls. And on the back of the picture, it says Avery and Zoe, 5 Lakeshore Drive, 79214, key under doormat. So I'm assuming that is probably for the accomplice, or maybe the accomplice wrote that to let them, let the killer know that's where they would be at. Maybe 79214 is like their, the entry code on a door or something. Some more details. So 5.06 a.m. first notice, call from Officer Paulson, new homicide case one dead one missing not sure which is which they're 19 years old five lakeshore drive not road 509 a.m called a sergeant anders requested the following roadblocks five mile radius in every direction activate all davenport pd officers and personnel send apb to all state county departments with description of missing woman helicopter in the air if available contact parents slash homeowner confirm csi on the way to the scene have Chief Valentine from the Washington State Police call me. 528, arrive at Lakeshore Drive. Two story log cabin entrances in the front and rear. No visible signs of forced entry or exit. 530, first responder interview officers Paulson and Martin. There's even a little drawing of them in there. Dispatch at 425 a.m., arrive 444 a.m., delayed due to getting wrong street address. Doors were locked, no signs of forced entry. Entered residence at 4.49 after seeing signs of a struggle through the window. Found one twin dead in the upstairs bedroom. They don't know which girl it is. No sign of the other twin. Officers cleared rest of the house and called for backup. Mom and stepdad arrive at 5.55 a.m. Mom in shock, hysterical, 100% genuine. Stepdad, oddly calm. 6.12 a.m. CSI team arrives. There's some preliminary findings. No Force entry, intruder had key in the security passcode as I figured that 79214 was. Avery was killed while fighting intruder upstairs. Zoe was tied up and dragged out front door. Key evidence found, photo of twins with names, address, and security code written on the back. 
Killer left this behind. Killer needed an accomplice who knew twins and the passcode. At least two people involved. This was planned. Photo of unidentified woman with devil's horns drawn on her head found near Avery's body. There's a couple of things she needs to find out, which is why were they alone at the house? Who knew they were there? Who has a key and security code? And who is the girl with the red horns? The next page. 6.24 a.m. There's an interview with Dr. Maureen Hamilton, which is their mother. She's a pediatrician and married to Stephen Welch. Why were the twins alone at the lake house? They came home Woodbury House unexpectedly from college last night. Both are freshmen at Seattle College. Announced plans to drop out, move back home, and focus on environmental causes. Stephen was furious. Argument ensued. Twins left around 7.30 to Lake House. Who else knew the twins were there? Just Stephen and her. The twins left abruptly. It wasn't planned. They asked mom not to tell anyone where they were. They wanted to be alone. Who has a key? Only she and Stephen carried keys. They kept an extra under the doormat. Confirmed the extra key is now missing. Who knows the security code? Passcode just changed a month ago. Only four people besides the twins knew the security passcode. Mom, stepdad, cousin, Courtney, and their father, Frank. Courtney is the twins' cousins on their father's side. Mom gave her the passcode two weeks ago to pick up some clothes the twins don't wear anymore. Twins' father, Frank, needed a place to stay last weekend, and Mom let him use the lake house. What did you do last night? Mom stayed home for the night. Steven went to the drugstore around 8 for ice cream, came back around 9, no ice cream. Both went to bed around 10.30. There's a lot of pages. Oh my lord. Who is the girl with red horns? Courtney Gardner, the twin's cousins. Not aware of any issues with either twin. Courtney is always kind of difficult. Ask mom to call cousin and father and tell them to get down here. 6.33 discussion with CSI team. Presumed course of events. Assailant enters front door and types in security alarm passcode. Ties up Zoe downstairs. Goes upstairs and strangles Avery. Drags Zoe out the front door. Takes Zoe to another location. Ask the CSI team to expand their search into the yard farther away from the house. 6.46 a.m. Washington State Police received call from Chief Valentine's secretary. Says they're on high alert but haven't set up roadblocks on all the bridges into Washington yet. Chief Valentine is not available now and wants me to call him back at 7. 6.53 a.m. There's an interview with the stepdad, Stephen. There's a picture sketch of him. He's an accountant. What happened last night? Twins came home unannounced around 7 and shared plans to quit school. Doesn't think 19-year-olds should live at home. Big argument. Twins left to the lake house. Woke up to a police call at 5 a.m. Where did you go last night? Went to the drugstore around 8 to grab his prescriptions. He has an antidepressant and sleep apnea. Came home, went to bed around 10. Did you tell anyone where the twins were? Saw Courtney, the cousin at the drugstore, mentioned it. Courtney was acting a bit unusual and was tightly clutching a brown paper bag. Where's Courtney right now? On her way. Should be here in an hour. Where's the twin's father? Not answering his phone. He's an alcoholic and a big loser. He lives on Edmonds Road, apartment 2 in Dirkland. Who else knew they were there? Weird neighbor lives about 200 yards northeast of the lake house in the old shack. Can't recall his name. Always peering at them with binoculars. He's 6'4", maybe 250 pounds. Crazy but not sure of diagnosis. He walked over here 15 minutes ago, but Steven sent him back to his house. Lived there for years, but says he was born in a mental institution. 7.34 a.m. Call to 911 dispatch. Listen to audio of Avery's 911 call. Not sure what to make of it. Requested a transcript. They'll fax it to the station. 7.54 evidence found ID card. CSI team found a patient ID card for Davenport Psychiatric Hospital in the grass. About 200 feet northeast of the house. Lenny Nelson is the suspect and probably the neighbor. Now there's a discussion with Officer Paulson. Knows Lenny Nelson, says he pretends to be dumb, but's actually very smart and dangerous. Offered to join me for interview, but I declined. Told him to finish his first responder report and get me the yellow copy. Also asked him to contact the psych hospital and get any details he can about Lenny. 8.15 a.m. There's an interview with Lenny Nelson, which is the neighbor. There's also a little house down here too. So he lives on Seven Lakeshore Drive. There's no phone, no wife, and no job. Lives about 200 yards northeast of the twin's house. Do you live in this house for the past 10 years? What were you doing last night? Stayed home, skinned a couple chipmunks on the front porch. Okay. Did you see anything unusual? Saw three cars in the lake house driveway last night. There is a twin's Jeep. Recognized their loud music with windows down. Not sure of the time. Unmarked white van. Driving slow. Stopped in the driveway for a bit. He's seen it in the neighborhood before, has a black passenger side door, trailing a large piece of equipment a few hours after sundown. Fancy sports car, belongs to some high-class real estate guy. Same guy visited him last week about buying land. 
left his business card, Davis Bateman. He's also another suspect. Are you a patient at DPH? Just released from a stay there, had a problem with some hikers and social workers said he had to go there. Insists he didn't escape, says he's only diagnosed as bipolar, thinks the ID fell out of his pocket while he was checking his animal traps. Next page. Do you own a vehicle? Old truck behind the house says it won't start, needs a new battery. Robo down by lake says he can't use it, doesn't have any oars. 836 call to Davis, Bateman left message to call me as soon as possible. 854 is discussion with Officer Paulson. Psych Hospital said Lenny was released against medical advice. No more details without a subpoena. Asked Officer Paulson to find the twins' dad. Frank, A59, called to the station. No promising leads yet from APB. Requested a background check on Lenny. Interview with Courtney. Where were you last night? Left work early, feeling sick. Went to the drugstore for Pepto and saw Steven, the stepdad, around 815. He told her the twins quit school, got in a fight with their mom, and left to the house. Where did you go after the drugstore? Called Avery at 8.30 to see if she could join them, but they wanted to be alone. Asked her not to tell anybody they were up there. Spent the night at Talia Carter's apartment, co-worker at the tattoo parlor. Did you tell anyone where they were? Got a call around 9 from her uncle Frank, looking for the twins. Said he was trying to reach them, but they were blowing him off too. She told him they were at the lake house. Do you know the security password? Think so, unless they changed it. Was up there a few weeks ago to pick up some clothes, sheets, towels, and stuff. Uses the key under the front mat, hasn't told anyone else. Why did we find a picture with devil horns drawn on your head? Says she doesn't know. Twins must have been mad at her sometimes. Seems like she's hiding something. 944 is a call to Talia Carter. Left a message to call me back as soon as possible. Need to confirm Courtney's alibi. 1003, arrive at police station. Picked up a 911 transcript. Print out maps, road and satellite views. No leads on white van. Requested background check on Bateman and Frank, the father, is still missing. 11 a.m. news conference. 11.48, call to Bateman Properties. Assistant says he's out of the office. 11.54, coroner's office. No new or helpful information. Signed and picked up the autopsy report. 1.20 p.m., discussion with Officer Paulson. Frank was passed out, really hungover. Interview with the dad. Frank has a fresh cut on his forehead. Sloppy appearance. Smells like booze. Completely distraught. Seems 100% genuine. When did you last talk to the twins? Called Avery and Zoe several times last night between 7 and 9, no answer. Trying to let them in on a hot deal he'd been working. What kind of a deal? Flipping a house. Needs one of them to co-sign the loan. Says it was an easy 50k. Avery eventually picked up around 9. Didn't want to talk about the house flip and she hung up when he said he could pay for a year of tuition. Do you know the security code at the cabin? Yes, Maureen let him stay there last weekend. He was having an issue with his landlord. Who else knows the code? Nobody he knows of. Did you go anywhere last night? Went to Bryson's Tavern, played a pool tournament, and had some beers. He left around 2.30 a.m. Wally at the bar can confirm. Who else did you tell where the twins were? Nobody. He never talks about the twins to anyone, which I find kind of hard to believe. Like, even when he's drunk, that he wouldn't talk about his kids to someone. How's the relationship with the twins? Not great. Oh, maybe this is why. Not great. Split with Maureen 14 years ago. Says she filed a restraining order, which has really gotten in the way of the relationship. Doesn't like or trust Maureen's husband. Steven thinks he's a jackass. 139 voicemail of Talia. She's at work with until 6. Can confirm alibi. 140 voicemail twins mom. Just remembered calling a tree company a few weeks ago to do some work at the house. No one else besides Frank and Courtney have been at the house recently. Didn't give them a key or security pass code. 141 call with twins trees landscaping. Confirmed call two weeks ago, too far for them, so they sent a local guy in Davenport, Vince Wolf. And there's his address and heading to his apartment. Interview with Vince Wolf, the tree guy. This is, well, I'm guessing that's the van that they're looking for. Did you do any recent work at Five Lakeshore Drive? Remembers the job from two weeks ago. Routine tree trimming around the house, didn't enter the house. Asked if the place got robbed, says it'd be easy since any idiot could have found that hidden key under the doormat. <laughs> Where were you last night? You finished a job at 9 p.m. and drove around Ashcroft Lake area scouting potential work. Unless you have your high beams on, how are you going to see trees that need trimming in the dark? Did you drive by their house? Yes, pulled in front of the house but saw the lights on and left. Then what did you do last night? Nothing, went home and sat on the couch. 2.51 called a station, requested background check on this guy. 334 call from Officer Paulson, found Bateman and brought him to the station. And she's going back to the station. Here is Davis Bateman, the real estate developer. His vehicle was seen at the lake house last night. 
Were you up near Ashcroft Lake last night? Yes, wants to buy property there for condo development. Has something big in mind right on the water. Was on that road last night, scoping plots, headed home around midnight. Says it's important to get the night view as well as the day. What are these people doing some after hour work? Did you see anything unusual last night? There's a big crazy guy hiding in the woods on Lake Shore Drive. Lenny Nelson confirmed meeting him earlier. Said Lenny was erratic, weird, and smelled like trash. Left him a card though. He was working on a truck when he met him. 5.15 p.m. CSI update. Talked to Humberto at the station. Blood and hair strands on the downstairs floor match Zoe's DNA. Confirmed she was dragged out the front door. Blood found near the body belongs only to Avery. No evidence of any other person in the house. Analysis confirmed 100% that killer entered security system passcode. Picked up CSI report and photos. Heading to tattoos by Veronica to confirm cousin's whereabouts. Interview with Talia, the cousin's co-worker. Was Courtney with you? Yes, she arrived between 8.30 and 9 p.m. Was she acting funny at all? Right after arriving, she took a call in the bathroom and then seemed kind of quiet. Got another call around 10 p.m. and went outside to speak to a man in the parking lot. Couldn't see the vehicle he was in, was looking from the balcony and there's a tree in the way. Courtney said it was a food delivery driver who got her order wrong. So Courtney fell asleep on the couch around 1 a.m. and Talia went to bed soon after. Heard her take a phone call around 7 and rush out the door. Courtney couldn't have left and came back because Talia has to buzz her in. Did you ever meet Avery and Zoe? Met once when they came for matching tattoos. Heading to Bryson's Tavern to interview bartender and confirm the father's alibi. Interview with Wally Bryson, the bartender. What time was Frank at the bar? Not sure when he arrived. Recall seeing him in the first round of the pool tournament around 10.30 p.m. He was there until last call and said he lost out on some real estate deal. Acting normal until his business partner came by to give him the bad news and then he seemed really down and started doing shots. Who's his business partner? Doesn't know him. He came in around 11 and sat with Frank in the back. Hasn't been in before. Introduced himself as Joe. Something. Doesn't remember. How late did Frank stay? Got really drunk by end of the night. Could barely stand. Fell on his way out and hit his forehead. Wally saw him stumbling toward home when he locked the door at 3.15 a.m. 7.16 p.m. Voicemail from Courtney. Lied about calling in sick to work. Was fired for being sick and missing shifts. Bought a pregnancy test last night at the drugstore and took it in Talia's bathroom. She's pregnant. Says Avery drew the horns on her pick as a joke. Avery calls her the devil on her shoulder because she always urged her to do bad things. Okay, so that is the detective's notebook. Definitely a lot of evidence. Opening up the envelope, it just has what crime and case this is for on the front. And then there's this little envelope here with some cards in it. The cards of everyone, pretty much. So this is the mother, Maureen. The stepfather, Stephen. Biological father. Davis Bateman. The real estate guy. Oh, he got a double-sided one. Look at him. He cute. The tree guy. Wally from the bar, Talia, the tattoo one that was friends with the cousin, the detective notebook that we have, Angie. We have some crime scene photographs here. Oh, they're tiny. Oh, always with the magnifying glass, y'all. Okay. I'm assuming a picture of the lake house that they were at. Trigger warning for some of these pictures, just to let you guys know that. Here's the one sister. Some bruising. There's me some blood. I'm assuming this is the tattoo that the girls got from Talia. Cracked iPhone. The alarm. Again, there's some blood. Probably the one sister's hair. I don't know if you can see it in the picture. Looks like some hair in the door. Like the floor of the door and then this is lenny nelson's id card that was found in the grass a picture of the girl with the red horns lenny nelson's actual id card here the inventory list of what's supposed to be included newspaper report here so 19 year old activist killed while twin sister abducted from the lake house our local community is in shock and on high alert today with news of a frightening incident during the early morning hours that left a 19-year-old Woodbury woman dead and her twin sister missing. At 4.30 a.m. this morning, Avery called 911 to report a break-in at her family's lake house. She was alone with her twin sister, Zoe. By the time police arrived at the scene, they found Avery dead inside the sister and no sign of either her sister, Zoe, or the intruder. A statewide manhunt soon followed as police departments throughout the region set up roadblocks and activated additional personnel, including canine and helicopter units, 
to help track down the killer and save Zoe. Detective Angie Cullen is leading the investigation for the police department and made a brief statement to the press during a news conference at 11. We have reason to believe Zoe is still alive and we're doing absolutely everything in our power to bring her back to her already grieving family. And then on the back, there's some ads up top. LJ Spruce and Company, Outfitters of Outdoor Apparel. There's Lindman's Lakeside Properties. Tomorrow marks one year anniversary of Roxanne Needle's disappearance. Friends and family of Roxanne are planning a gathering at 4 p.m. tomorrow in Davenport Park to mark the one year anniversary of the young woman's mysterious disappearance. She would have turned 18 last Friday, was camping with several friends in Davenport Preserve just east of Ashcroft Lake when she went missing. She was last seen gathering firewood around 4 p.m. When friends noticed she had been gone a long time, they searched the area and called in authorities when it started to get dark. This wasn't like Roxanne. She knew these woods well and always kept in contact with us when we were out hiking. We thought she was pranking us at first, said Dean Wells, her former boyfriend. Search parties scoured the area for weeks but came up empty-handed. There have been reports of a large black bear getting into people's trash. We're truly hoping and praying that Roxanne didn't meet up with it, said the lead investigator at the time, Mark Grayson. And then it says, Miss Needles, the fifth young woman to have gone missing in these woods in the past 10 years. There's Klondike's canoe sales and rentals at the bottom here it's a little weird that there's been that many disappearances of women now this is the 911 transcript this is 911 dispatch what's your emergency there's a muffled noise i'm sorry ma'am you're gonna have to speak up how can i help you there's a guy in my house we're getting robbed i think i'm not sure who he is he's downstairs i need police please can you help us what's your address um i'm on ashcroft lake lakeshore drive number five in davenport that's number five lakeshore road in davenport yeah can you send how long is it going to sending police right now i have a patrol car that should be there within a few minutes what's your name avery my sister zoe's downstairs with him she's all tied up how many people did you see just one a man he was um, wearing all black did you see a gun any weapons no i don't think so i heard something and looked down the stairs and saw him and zoe in the living room he was tying her up and he had like tape over her mouth he was in all black with a hood and gloves that's all i saw i think he saw me are you hiding avery can you get under the bed or in a closet or I'm in the closet. I have help coming right now, Avery. What else did you see? Muffled noise. Did you see anything else, Avery? I can hear him. He's coming up the stairs. And then there's nine seconds of silence followed by the sound of a door opening, a woman's scream, and some muffled noises. Avery, are you okay? Are you there? And then the phone disconnects. The first responders report. This The reporting officer is Jack Paulson. Timer report, 9.37 a.m. Officer Billy Martin and myself received a dispatch at 4.25 a.m. to respond to a home invasion at 5 Lakeshore Road. Officer Martin and I arrived at 5 Lakeshore Road at 4.29, but I thought something was wrong because dispatch told us there may be a woman in a closet on the second floor and... The road is a single floor home. I radio dispatch and after waiting a full four or five minutes, they confirmed the break-in was actually underway at the drive, at least 10 minutes away from where we were. We arrived to the scene at the drive at 444. It was a one lane gravel road with a single street light. Neither of us recall any other vehicles on the road at that time. We saw nothing unusual on the property, no signs of forced entry into the home. Officer Martin stayed out front while I looped around the home and checked the back door. I gave a hard knock on the front door and announced ourselves. No one answered and we couldn't hear any sounds from inside. I peered into the front window and saw an overturned potted plant lying on the floor. I immediately radioed Sergeant Anders at 449 and received clearance to enter. I announced my intent to kick open the door and proceeded to do it. We entered carefully with our guns and flashlights drawn. We did not hear any noise or movement, but I nearly fell after slipping into a small pool of blood about three feet inside the front door. Following protocol, we cleared the first floor, then ascended the stairs to the second where dispatch warned us a woman may be hiding in a closet. In the master bedroom upstairs, we found a female lying face up on the floor. Officer Martin checked vitals and confirmed the victim was deceased. Her neck was scratched red and looked to have been strangled by extreme force. A shattered cell phone was next to her left hand. After clearance of the second floor, we requested backup, medical, and CSI team. We phoned homicide, Detective Angie Cullen, directly to notify her. The owner of the house and mother's twins, Maureen, arrived at 5.55 a.m. in a black four-door SUV with the stepfather. Crime scene investigation report. So the lead analyst is Humberto Primavera and lead detectives Angie. The narrative is secluded lake house, set back from roadway, no forced entry through front door slash back door windows. All windows and doors were connected to the security system, which was confirmed to be armed, indicating intruder had the passcode. Three sets of recently created tire tracks were identified in the driveway, although nothing was clean enough to get any tread patterns from or identify. About Avery Gardner, now the body was pressed for fingerprints, bite mark evidence, bruises, hairs and fibers, what it's looking like.
No non-family prints found on the body. The killer was reported as wearing gloves and our investigation confirms. Only shoe prints found inside or outside were those of the first responding officer who stepped in a puddle of blood. Four brown hair strands on the threshold of the front door. Samples collected and sent to lab for analysis. No relevant findings on blood spatter. Some blood was found near the front door that appears to belong to the kidnapped victim, but splatter marks are inconclusive. It's a very clean crime scene. Suspect appears to have been very careful not to leave any traces behind. Basically repeating itself of the evidence that was found. There's some pictures of how the house looks on the inside. Coroner report. Victim was found lying on back with finger marks on the neck indicating strangulation face flush with severely bloodshot eyes and a small amount of blood coming from nose damage to carotid arteries and neck damage to trachea asphyxiation resulting in brain death signs of a struggle in room strangled from the front until asphyxiation took place and asphyxia by manual strangulation was her cause of death post-mortem scan picked up no brain activity a deep abrasion was found on the palm of left hand I conclude the victim used the phone as a weapon against the assailant and the glass from the broke screen caused that injury. Pretty much the same information over. A little map here. This is the house that they were at. Lenny's house is over here. Do I want to say that I don't think Lenny is like the murderer? I feel like he would be easy to blame because his ID card was found. They're saying there's a direct line of sight so he could obviously see them. And over here is Woodbury and Dirkland about 35 miles west. Another map of everyone else's apartment so as you can see everyone other than what is his name vincent vince wolf he's really the only one that's kind of close to where the girls are at everyone else would have to travel quite a bit but i mean i guess if you're determined enough to want to kill someone you would make the drive <laughs> our suspects finally these are the last pieces of evidence we finally made it guys Honestly, I feel like I've been talking for three hours. Davis Bateman, real estate guy, I think. He has some aliases, which is a little strange. Wendell Scott, Joseph Washington, Anderson Spellman. He has a couple of court cases that were against him. Invasion of personal privacy, not guilty, sentence none. Restraining order, which is still open. Assault, first degree. It was a felony, not guilty. He didn't get sentenced for anything, let me just say that. Private indecency misdemeanor he was not guilty restraining order misdemeanor it was issued but it expired now and luring a minor it was a felony not guilty and the status is closed these all have happened at different points in his life and he's 37 now lenny so alias is, is just his name spelled with a y rather than an ie distinctive futures he has very thick forearms was there any distinctive futures for him no there's nothing for this guy Thick forearm. He has some cases here. He has menacing, misdemeanor. He was guilty and social services intervention and it's closed. Stalking misdemeanor. He was guilty, a thousand dollar fine. It's all of the cases are closed against him now. Assault, second degree. He was guilty, six months prison, 50 hours community service. Disorderly conduct, guilty with a $500 fine. Unlawful entry into a motor vehicle, $200 fine. Animal abuse, first degree. He got 200 hours of community service. Last, we have Vince Wolf here. He got some different aliases. He, he goes by Vinny Pop, Vin, Joe Mamba, King Papa, and the Lobo. He has tattoos all over his body and a scar on his left hand. So a couple of cases against him. All these cases are closed and he was guilty for all of them. Unlawful transport of coniferous trees. He had a thousand dollar fine. Robbery, first degree, four years prison, 500 hours of community service. Assaulting a public safety officer, he got three years prison and 100 hours community service. Strangulation, three years, three years prison, that's it. 100 hours community service, I guess he didn't kill the person. Unlawful use of a weapon, 18 months prison, 50 hours community service. Manslaughter, second degree, five years prison and 100 hours community service. He was 19 when that happened. I don't know, this guy looking kind of guilty right now because he got similar things that happened to the girls. Strangulation, manslaughter, robbery. We have to figure out who we think the accomplice is. I don't really know who I would think the accomplice is yet. So I'm like going through and I, I'll admit, I sometimes press like the hint option. I don't ever like to Google it because then you'll probably get the answer. So they always typically will give you the option to for a hint and the hint was have you visited any websites during like your investigation earlier i was showing those cards from every person from like the 
the mother and Davis, Vince, like everyone with that was associated. Going through all of them, I did not expect this person though. And I don't really know why or I'm gonna show you all on my computer just so that this makes more sense. Which item is needed to identify the accomplice? So we got card Wally Bryson. What part of Wally's card do you need? His website. What page on Bryson's tavern do you need? Photos. Let me show you why I say that. Who do we have, y'all? Who do we got in the back here? Okay, I can't zoom in. We got the, the twin's father. And look at, I mean, okay, this is so photoshopped. But this person with the hood got a picture of the girls there that was found on the floor or whatever in the house. Did I not say typically what parent doesn't talk about their kids? especially when they're drunk. Solved objective one. A photo on Bryson's tavern shows Frank, the father, with the killer. Envelope A. Objective two is identify the killer. When you identify the person who murdered Avery and abducted Zoe, you go check it again. Then you'll have to pick what the evidence was that showed you who the killer was. This is from Jack Paulson again. Dear investigator, I cannot thank you enough for helping us identify the accomplice. I know Angie will be impressed that you found that picture of Frank conspiring with the killer on Bryson's tavern website. It sent shivers down my spine when I saw that photo of the twins in the killer's hands. The SWAT team and I acted immediately after receiving your tip about Gardner. We surrounded his apartment with guns blazing, hoping to arrest him and find the killer, Zoe, and my Angie. As soon as I walked through the door, though, I realized we were too late. Frank was dead. He'd been strangled in on his living room floor. Once again, we couldn't find any traces of evidence to identify the killer, but my friend Humberto on the CSI team is certain the markings come from the same hands that took Avery's life. It would be an understatement to say I was relieved after we cleared the apartment and found no signs of Angie or Zoe. The killer must have them both, but who is it? We found Angie's cruiser parked around the back of the apartment, so I'm certain she must have run into the killer there. I hope and pray that she's still alive, but it feels like we're running out of time. The only new clue we have is a page torn from Angie's notebook that Humberto found under the driver's seat of her cruiser. I included a copy of it for you to read. This is the page that we have. Seven o'clock, call to Chief Valentine at Washington State Police. Per his request, confirm that all bridges from Oregon into Washington have roadblocks set up as of 7 a.m. Washington State Police have an active serial killer investigation over the border just north of Davenport Preserve. Lead investigator is Detective Bobby Miller. Interview continued. What else can you tell me about him? Seemed really quiet, kind of creepy and aloof. Didn't talk much. What was he wearing? Black hooded sweatshirt. Had some emblem on the chest. It was a logo of something and it cuts off. I don't know who she's talking about. What interview was continued from earlier? It's just, I don't know why this page would be ripped out. Like why Angie would rip this out of her little notebook here. Seven o'clock, who is she interviewing? Angie, the detective, she puts PM and AM on everything, but of course for this seven o'clock one, she doesn't put it. So we don't know if she was either talking to the stepdad or probably Wally again, because Wally, not that he was the accomplice, but he also, he kind of played a part in this, whether or not he knew it. Who's his business partner? This is talking about Frank. So whoever Frank introduced himself as Joe, Someone's alias is Joe. Okay, but there's there's two Joes. We have Joe Mamba and Joseph Washington. So either one of these could be who is a business partner with Frank. What does Frank do? Doesn't he do like demolition or some gardener demolition? I'm gonna say actually his business partner might be what's his name? Davis Bateman, because this is the real estate guy. So you would think, or at least I would think demolition has to kind of do with real estate because you I don't even know you destroy a place and then put it up for sale I think it's Davis Bateman that he's that the business partner is I'm gonna say it's the offense profile and that page is the two pieces of evidence we'll go see if the police department wants to hire me at this point I honestly am open to availability and that was correct Bateman uses alias Joe Washington at Bryson's Tavern envelope B this is from that same Jack Paulson. He did it again, and this time I'm glad to say that your detective work allowed us to save Zoe. I just wish I could say the same for Angie right now. I wish our rescue was as brilliant, but Batemoon was ready for us and heavily booby-trapped his entire house. When the SWAT team and I stormed the building, we were met with a barrage of explosions like nothing I'd seen in 12 years in the Marines. The rest of the team retreated when the first bomb went off, but I pushed into the fire looking for Angie. Amid the chaos, I followed the sound of a woman's voice to the basement where I found Zoe tied up in the corner. After hoisting her onto my shoulder and turning for the exit, I caught Angie's eyes across the smoke-filled basement. She was standing right next to Bateman and he was holding a gun to her temple. I froze for an instant, unsure what to do when Angie screamed out to me, get her out of here, save her. 
I listen to Angie. I carry Zoe up the stairs. I turn back to see Bateman lead Angie into a tunnel in the floor. He followed her down. As soon as I got Zoe to safety and turned back to the house, the entire structure collapsed into a raging inferno. We immediately put the five mile radius around his house in complete lockdown and the public works department soon informed me of a large storm drain pipe that runs right under Bateman's house. It's large enough for a person to escape, but they couldn't travel more than three miles from there without coming above land. After the fire was out, I confirmed the tunnel connected to the drain pipe. I've explored every inch of that underground system. I'm thankful I didn't find Angie in there. Just wish I knew where she was. This is a letter from Zoe. I'm just gonna briefly try to go over this. To the hero detective, thank you. Thank you for saving me from that evil monster Davis. I'm still in shock. I don't know where he took Angie, but I wanted to share my experience in case it may help you find her. It all started when Avery and I were at our family cabin on Ashcroft Lake. Avery went upstairs to bed around midnight and I fell asleep watching TV. I woke up to a masked man on top of me covering my mouth with gloved hands. I wanted to yell at Avery for help, but before I could make a noise, he had pinned me down and taped my mouth shut. He tied my feet together, I looked up the stairs and saw Avery. He must have seen her too because as soon as he finished tying my feet together, he walked upstairs into the room where she was hiding. I couldn't move, I couldn't do anything. He came back downstairs alone. I tried to fight as he dragged me out the front door, but I was tied and could only do so much. He stuffed me into his trunk and drove away. When the trunk opened, we were inside a garage. It was Bateman's house, I now know. He put a bag over my head, threw me down a set of basement stairs, and said if I moved even an inch, he'd kill me. He shut the door and left me. I had just given up when Bateman suddenly burst through the basement door again with a woman I didn't know, also bound and gagged. He threw her next to me and she hit her head really hard. It was Angie. We were able to whisper to each other. I'm not sure how much time went by, but it felt like years. We were planning an escape when the explosion started. Just after the first blast, Bateman rushed down the stairs with a gun and said he needed a hostage to get to the hideout. He untied my feet, Angie begged him to take her instead and swore she would get him out alive if he let me go. He agreed. You know where the killer is hiding from the police with the detective, visit the page to prove it. Maps of this guy, probably I think where this guy lives, Bateman. So Bateman's house is over here. There's some drain pipe that goes for about three miles. They have this little thing that shows it's five miles. I don't know if you guys can see that. Let me take, let me take my finger. Let's try to get half of five. See where he would end up at. Let me look at his cards. Um, okay, he lives in Linney Avenue, or that's where his business is located. Yeah, it doesn't show the street. I'm gonna say he took her somewhere that like they're working on building. Back on the computer, we shall go. This is Davis Bateman's website of vacant properties. Let's see, his house is here. So the closest would be probably Fowler, this coniferous way here, I would assume. Which two items are needed? The map, maybe? Road map of region or area? Um, it's just the road map, I think, is that. Bateman property website, let's see. Where do you think he's hiding? Coniferous. Yeah, he must be hiding within five miles of his house, because that would be a lot of walking. There's a vacant... Oh, I didn't even see that. I just looked at which one was the most convenient, closest but there's a drain pipe somewhere. I would not have even noticed that. Open up the final envelope. A letter now from Angie. Not sure what to say. Zoe and I are only alive today because of your intelligence and persistence. Thought you might be interested to hear that we also caught the serial killer responsible for killing Roxanne Needle and several other women that went missing in Davenport and up in Washington. The Washington State Police matched DNA from one of their crime scenes with some DNA we pulled off Lenny Nelson's hospital ID card. We, he wound up confessing to several murders over the course of the last decade. No way! I didn't think it was him for this case, but okay, wow. A confession now from Davis. Killed Avery. I also killed Frank, kidnapped Zoe, and abducted Detective Cullen. It was never supposed to come this far. I had no intentions of killing anyone. The plan which Frank and I came up with together was supposed to play out differently, but things got out of hand quickly and I wish I'd never gotten involved. I met Frank a week ago at his ex-wife's home in Davenport, Five Lakeshore Drive. I came to the door because I was interested in buying the land it sat on. Frank said he'd sell in a heartbeat but was no longer the owner. His ex was and she'd never sell. Apparently she says the fond memories it holds are priceless. It's hard for me to take no for an answer and I jokingly asked him what the price would be if he, it held some not so fond memories too. That's when the conversation took a darker tone. I could make millions developing there and Frank needed cash in a bad way. We met a couple more times and came up with a plan. No one should have gotten hurt. We, or rather I, would just spook the family a bit, make them feel their safe haven was not anything but. Then they sell to me and I'd pay Frank a very generous rate to demolish the house. The plan was to tie up the girls and scare them. We figured a few hours of fearing for their lives is all it would take to put a stain on those priceless memories. It would have worked if Avery hadn't ruined everything. I had to kill her because she fought back. 
That girl wouldn't give up and strangling her was the only way I could stop her. I knew Frank would go straight to the cops if I killed his other daughter too, so I took her back to my house as a bargaining chip. I met Frank at his apartment. I made him a fair offer, keep his mouth shut or lose the other daughter. I didn't like his counter offer and our negotiations fell apart, leaving me no choice but to take him out too. Just after I finished with him, who knocks on the door but some snoop detective. I hid in the closet when she kicked the door open and I snuck up behind her while she was trying to revive Frank. I thought she might also be worth more alive than dead so I brought her to my basement. I had some time to prepare before the SWAT team arrived and fortunately those preparations bought me just enough time to escape to one of my nearby vacant homes with detective as a hostage. I was going to keep her alive in the shed for a few weeks until I was ready to make my run to the border but that plan went out the window as soon as the SWAT team stormed the house. If only that blasted girl hadn't fought back, no one would have gotten hurt and I would have gotten my lakefront property. It's a shame what happened, those condos would have been beautiful. And there's this, this last picture here. Not really sure what it's supposed to be. That is everything. It was a lot more like exciting and kind of surprising than I expected, but I actually like this one a lot. If you played along, let me know if you knew all along, if you were right. I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.